Hello, and welcome to the Forces Unit in Phys 1104. We're more than halfway through the course, and we haven't even mentioned the word force yet, but that's about to change. Up until now in the course, we've been very focused on isolated systems, and looking at them, we've developed some very powerful methodologies. If we take our typical example of carts colliding on a track, the system is isolated, and so the momentum is conserved, and that gives us an equation. So if there's an unknown, we might be able to solve for it using that equation. If we have more than one unknown, but the collision is elastic, then we can either use the fact that the kinetic energy is conserved or that the relative speed is unchanged. Either way, we have another equation, and we can solve for another unknown. Alternatively, if it isn't elastic, but it's closed, and we know something about how the internal energy changes, then we can use the fact that the total energy is conserved, or alternatively, if we know the coefficient of restitution, we can use that, and either way, again, we have a second equation. And we like equations, we can solve for unknowns using them. Well, what if the interaction with the track is not negligible? What if our system isn't isolated? In that case, momentum isn't conserved, and also the interaction with the track is going to tend to cause state changes in the environment, like warming of the track, and so the system energy will not be conserved. And so we don't have any equations to work with. What do we do to understand systems that are interacting with their environments? Because those systems are very common. For example, when a shot putter is throwing the ball, this is definitely not an isolated system. The shot putter doesn't recoil when they throw the ball. There's a strong frictional force between their feet and the ground. And there are all sorts of other systems that we would like to be able to understand, but which the methods we've been looking at won't help us much with. The answer is that we're going to have to look more closely at the nature of the interactions between the objects and their environment. We're going to have to look at forces. That's not only going to give us methods that are new and different from what we've been doing, but they'll allow us to do other things that'll improve the very powerful methods that we've already learned. Let's suppose that you're riding your bike and you've just come down a big hill, so you're going pretty fast, and you put on your brakes, and uh-oh, your brakes have failed. You can't stop. And as a result, there's nothing you can do about it. You are going to hit this great big rock wall. Well, this is going to give us a great opportunity to talk through the intuitive idea of what a force is. Because you have an intuitive sense that when you hit that wall, there will be something that you might call a force of impact on you. That force is going to be pretty big. And if we think about what its strength depends on, we'll be able to figure out a few things about what a force is. Now, what does the strength of the force depend on is a somewhat abstract idea. So, putting it more concretely, we could say, how do we make this force bigger? Or how do we make it stronger? Well, you're moving at the wall with some velocity. And you probably have a sense that if you increase that velocity, if you're going faster when you hit the wall, the wall is going to exert a larger force on you. It's going to hurt more if you hit the wall going faster. But that's not the only way that we can change the force on you. If you were carrying a great big pile of bricks on your back, effectively that increases your inertia. And you probably also have a sense that if you have a higher inertia, again, the force that the wall exerts on you to bring you to rest is going to have to be larger than if you didn't have that big load of bricks on your back. So what's going to happen is that the force that the wall exerts on you is going to bring you to rest. It's going to change your velocity. And the strength of the force depends on two things so far. It depends on your change in velocity. And note, I say change in velocity, not change in speed. If you just had a glancing blow with the wall that slightly changed the direction you were going in, that might hurt, but it's not going to be nearly such a big force as if you smack straight into the wall and it brings you to rest. So clearly the direction matters. Also, it clearly depends on your inertia. 
Well, we know exactly what depends on velocities, including direction and inertia. It's momentum. And so force must be somehow related to your change of momentum during your collision with the wall. Well, that's not the only thing it depends on, though. Let's think about how we can make this force on you smaller. So suppose there was a truck driving by and a big stack of mattresses fell off the truck and is lying there in front of the wall. Now you're going to hit the stack of mattresses instead of the wall. And you probably already know that the force on you is going to be smaller. But why? Because notice, your change in momentum is going to be exactly the same as it was without the stack of mattresses. You're going to go from, say, 40 kilometers per hour in the x direction down to zero, just like you were going to if you hit the rock wall. What is it that the mattresses change so that the force is smaller? Well, they sort of cushion the blow. They make the process of you coming to rest take longer. They slow it down. And so your change in momentum happens over a longer time. It's more gradual, and that's why the force on you is smaller. So the force depends both on your change in momentum and on the amount of time that it takes for that change to take place. The force exerted on an object is the rate of change of the object's momentum with respect to time. Notice that forces result from interactions. These particular forces resulted uh, from the interaction between you and the mattresses. And these forces occur in pairs. The mattresses exert a force on you, which brings you to rest. You also exert a force on the mattresses, which compresses them. And also, forces are vector quantities. They must be, because they're related to a change in momentum. And your change in momentum during the collision with the wall is a vector. We can see that forces are vectors intuitively, because they have direction and magnitude. I can push a chair across a floor by exerting a force on it horizontally. But if I exert a rather similar force upward, I can lift the chair. So the effect of a force depends on the direction it's exerted. Direction matters for forces. But magnitude, or the strength of the force, also matters. If I want to throw the chair, then I'm going to have to exert a stronger force than it would have taken to lift it. So forces have a magnitude, which we often call their strength. So forces have direction and magnitude. They are therefore vectors. Check your understanding. If you're in my course and you're doing this video via Moodle, Moodle is going to ask you a question now. Otherwise, you should just try and answer this before you go on to the second part of this video. So, suppose you push a large box across a floor, and let's say you're pushing it at a constant velocity, a meter per second in the positive x direction, and the box has an inertia of 30 kilograms. Well, you are definitely pushing, you're exerting a force. What is the rate of change of momentum of the box? 